never have enough time to play at all You know everybody wants to walk in someone else's shoes Everyone's forgot who they are Such a grind, wasted time Alright, I'm going to try and do a brief overview of JMRI and some of the connections that we've done with LCC. Uh, if you're not familiar with JMRI, basically what it is, it's a, it's a way to control your train layout with your computer. It's an interface that you can program DCC uh, decoders, uh, layout controls, animation, things like that. Uh, so here's here's the site. And I actually looked on here to see if I could find what JMRI stands for. Obviously, the the MR I'm assuming is Model Railroad, but I couldn't actually find anywhere where it said what the acronym stands for. But you'll go to this site uh, depending on whether or not you're a Windows or a Mac user. Uh, you need to check with your current version of your operating system and make sure you're downloading the correct one, but it's a free download, so you don't really have anything to lose by trying it. Uh, but uh, here's the site. Now, I've already downloaded it, and, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, got it right here. Now, I have not configured it yet completely clean so that you can kind of see the the step from beginning to end so here it is pulled up and the first thing I need to do is establish a connection so you can see right here by default it comes up with the connection and you can you can have multiple connections okay uh, for our purposes now I'm just going to connect to one connection all right <clears throat> so the system manufacturer depending on what you're making use of you've got scroll down window here for lots of different things most people use Digitrax uh, and that if you're using more than one system that's what the multiple connections are for so for our purposes today we're going to scroll down here to where open LCB is because that's what we're actually going to connect with Okay, now we're looking to our connection on the computer. Uh, let's see, well, not yet. Yeah, here it is. So here, here is what I'm making use of, LCC buffer USB. So this is the actual device that I purchased from uh, RR circuits that should allow me to connect. Now we're looking for the actual port that we're plugged into on the computer. And let's see. It's not going to be anything that says Bluetooth. See, I'm going to guess it's this one right here. I've really only got two choices. Uh, so I'm going to go with that one and hope that that's it. Protocol settings. I'm not going to mess with that or the fast clock. Additional settings, the baud rate, I believe that is correct. So all that should be good. Uh, I'm going to hit save. So now we're going to have to restart. Uh, panel Pro. Now we're going to go to preferences here. Let's see. Looks like everything's saved. Now here's, here's the, the overall menu for everything you can do. You've got your file that's uh, decoder definitions and whatnot. I haven't messed with any of that yet. Roster, you can create rosters for your, uh, your power and things like that. You got your panels. This is pretty important because you're probably going to have to have a panel to, to do anything with. And then here's the open LCB. 
Uh, and this is what we're looking for specifically right here. Uh, my tower LCC, my uh, signal LCC is what this is going to fall under. So we're going to see if we can find it. And there it is. We have a good connection because it's showing up right there. This is my uh, Malta signal node. I've already named it because what I did was is I just robbed one of the nodes off of my layout that I'm not making use of yet so that I could show you how to do this uh, in the comfort of my studio. So you hit this drop down <clears throat> and you have open configuration dialog. So that's what we're going to hit. And now it's communicating. You can see all the bytes scrolling through there. And then this is basically the inner interface for what you're looking at. So we've got lines one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. You can see uh, I did a little test earlier, but when I first got started with this, I made a push button with this. So here it is. And since I've done nothing yet on line seven and eight, and it's, it's clean, I figure I'll just go right ahead and, and show you how to configure something. Before I figure the channels, I think I'm gonna go ahead and create a, a test layout so that we have something to look at to kind of have some relevance to what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna go ahead and close out of the configuration nodes. And I'm gonna go up here to panels. And we're gonna to go to new panel, layout editor. So here we have a grid and we can create our layout. Uh, so it, this is not the easiest thing to work with, but it, it is, it's functional. So you've got turnouts, track, track nodes, some labels, uh, you know, and a few other things here that I haven't really messed with yet because I haven't found a need to. Uh, eventually, I'm sure I will. But the first thing we want to do is create a turnout. And the way you do that is you're going to hit shift and then you're gonna left click. And you can see it pops up there on the grid and it's really small. So we're gonna to go to zoom and you can see you have options. You can go you know, eight times in if you really need to. Uh, and then on my Mac here, if I do command equals, it zooms in and then the command minus zooms back out, okay? <clears throat> now, in order to move this turnout, you right click and hold, and then it will. you can put it wherever you want. If you put it up here in the left-hand corner, it does some weird things where the grid disappears and uh, relationship to where you put it, but if you put it back here in the center, the grid shows up. I don't know why it does that, it's just one of those things. Now, if we want to rotate it, you right click on the turnout, you go to rotate, left click, and then whatever you want to rotate it by, you put it in as a number value. Uh, so if you want to go 45 degrees, it'll turn it 45 degrees. Uh, and likewise, if you go negative 45 degrees, it will go the opposite direction, a negative being counterclockwise. And I want to go 180 degrees. So there we go. We've got a right hand turnout. Let me go ahead and line it here up on the grid. And I believe there's some options here. Uh, not sure there's a way you can get this to snap to the grid 
I remember right, grid options under options, show grid, snap to grid when adding, snap to grid when moving, I think is what I want. Yeah, so now it's going to perfectly line up with the grid somewhere. I'm going to put it right here dead center of the screen. And I'm going to go ahead and zoom in uh, a little more. All right. <clears throat> now, the next thing. Uh, is going to be track nodes. You can do an end bumper, an anchor point, or an edge connector. I'm not sure what an edge connector is yet. I haven't used one. But the anchor points are what allow you to, to connect a section of track to any other section of track. So again, you're going to hit shift and left click, and then that is your anchor point. And then you can move that anchor point wherever you want to. So we're going to put one there, we'll put one here, and we'll put one here. And now you can see, every time you move this out, the grid moves further away from it. All right, so that looks pretty good. Now we're going to go up here to track, and we're going to go with track segment. Again, I'm going to shift left click on the anchor point and then now you can draw where you want your track to connect so you draw it over here and you let go of your left click shift left click let go shift left click let go <clears throat> so we've got a, a little test track here so each of these circles are a, think of them as a node to, to see what you've got going on. Uh, different items here, and the edit is what we'll be doing mostly, but each of, each of these are going to be a, a block for our block detection. And this may be a representation of, it could be a representation of, you know, three sections of flex track put together all in the same block. Uh, you can also manipulate the, uh, the turnout a little bit too. Uh, and you can see how that works. If you move this one, the other one's always going to move too. But that's, uh, that's what we're going to ride with right there. We've got a turnout and we've got three blocks. So that we can put our information from our configuration nodes into these different elements. Uh, the next thing we need to do, once we've got this the way we want it, we're going to go to File, and we're going to Store Panels. And I've already done this once. I'm going to overwrite it and save it. There we go. Let's uh, go back to our configuration node. So back up here at the top at the open LCB, configure nodes. And we're looking for this node here. And if you had, uh, you know, multiple nodes, multiple different uh, devices, this is where it would show up at. Open configuration dialog. And here we are. So this is where we make all the changes and configure everything that we want to make happen. So right here you can see the node name. You have the name and the description. And there's lots of different ways you could do this. Uh, the way I'm going to do it, as you can see this is my proposed larger layout. And this is the actual uh, time saver that that I've built and in within the larger layout it is actually uh, the town of Malta 
is what I'm calling it. So that's exactly how I'm going to label it. And I'm also going to use the device name. This, this is a signal LCC, so uh, signal tower. So signal LCC Malta. So if I have more than one uh, signal LCC, this would the name Malta will uh, define it as to where it's at. And then what do I want this actual device to do? And when it's when it's orange like that, you have to hit right in order for the changes to occur. Uh, in the description, I just I want it to to describe exactly what I want it to do. And on this for this test thing, uh, you know, we're just going to do some some testing. So I'm just going to put test for Malta, and eventually I'll change that when I actually make use of it. Okay. Uh, now, I'm not sure what this block is so far. I have not seen or found any reference to this as being necessary for anything. Eventually I will, I'm sure. But here are the eight channels that we're going to configure. So this is channel one and all the information underneath it will, will be the same for each channel until you define it. So right now we're going to use line one or channel one as uh, a block occupancy. And if you will remember from our layout that we created, uh, we actually have three blocks. So we want to define these as three different blocks. And I will just call this block one, block two, and block three. So if we want line one to be block one, the way I do it is I put BK dash one and again Malta because you know in the greater picture of things you're going to have lots of different blocks and within a defined section you might have more than one block uh, more than one block one I'm not sure about that yet but I, that's the way I'm thinking about it right now uh, now we've got output function versus input function. So each of these lines can be configured either as an output or an input. And this is where it gets a little confusing. So if you think of, of the output or the input as it relates to the actual device that you're making use of, it helps a little bit. We're making use of a block detector board. That block detector board produces a signal. So it's sending a signal to uh, this particular node, this line here. So it's actually going to come into this. So it's, we need to configure it as an input because it's, it's receiving a signal. Okay, uh, then as you scroll, and, and it is from the factory already set up for active low. Each of these has a drop down where you have multiple different categories or options in which you can configure it. But we're, we're, not, we're not going to make use of the output function on this line, only the input. So you have active high, active low, alternating active high, active low, sample, sample low, uh, and all these do slightly different things. But for block, to block occupancy, really all we're going to do is worry about active low uh, and active high. And the way I think about this is basically it's active low and active high means that the 
the voltage is going to remain steady, if you will, and the difference between the two is polarity. If you change that to active high, you've actually changed the polarity. That's the way I understand it. <clears throat> okay, then we have the events. So line one can uh, create either consumer events or producer events. And so it can actually create six different consumer events and six different producer events. So the way to think about this, a producer, if you will, creates a signal in which something else is going to see. And then a consumer uh, actually sees the signal and acts on it, if, if that makes sense to you. Consumers acts on events, producers create events. So since we're, this is a block occupancy detector, we are going to create as an input this event here. Okay, so when this event occurs, something is going to happen. Okay, and so with it just like it is, what we need to do is we need to create a sensor that is this particular ID number. And you can kind of think of this ID number as almost as like a decoder number, if you will. This, this is a very unique number. And if you'll actually look, the last two digits are 00. zero. Event 2 will be 01, zero, 02, zero, 03, zero, so on and so forth. So each of these events here are numerically in order with the first event. And it will be the same way down here in the producer events, where this ends, the first event ends in 06, 7, 8, 9, so on and so forth. So since we're going to uh, produce an event <clears throat> for block occupancy, here's kind of how that works. You're, you're taking information from the tracks, you're producing uh, an event, and which JMRI will actually be the consumer and then our track will light up, you know, that we created on the, the actual layout. So that's kind of how that works. Uh, we're producing a signal and then JMRI is actually going to consume the information. So to do that, we need this event to trigger something here. So if this is block one, we need this event to highlight that track. So what we do is we come down here at the very bottom and you can see this where it says sensor turnout creation. Okay, so you can see right here this event ID is blank, it's all zeros. All we have to do is come up to when this event occurs, because that's what we're doing when the event occurs, we're going to copy and we're going to paste there. So that is going to be the active. Okay, now event two up here will be the opposite. This is, think of this as the on and this is the off. So now we're going to copy that. And you can see that the event number is one, one different copy, and we're going to paste down here. So you can see the ID event is on for active with 00, zero and it is closed or off for zero, 01. So we're going to now make a sensor. We have just made a sensor. Okay, now, what is the sensor going to do? Right now it's doing nothing because we've, we've got it set to none. So in event one, we want it to be on active. In event two, we want it to be off inactive. So event one is going to be turning 
the LED on. Event two is turning the LED off. Okay. And, and you know, physically how that works is, is when the train comes onto this block because we have a CT coil that I've, I've showed you in my previous videos, the CT coil picks up the, the resistance between the rails and it produces a signal to the, to the detector board. And then the detector board uh, then produces this number right here. So now what we're going to do is we're going to edit this. And you can see that right now we've got a solid line style. It's, it's siding track. We can actually change that to main line if we want a thicker line. That's the only difference is thick line versus thin line. <clears throat> and we need to do a block name. And we decided that this was going to be BK-1. It's the should. And you need to kind of be very careful about how you name and determine things because everything, it gets real confusing if you have different numbers meaning different things. <clears throat> okay. Done. Now, we need to create or edit the block itself. So we created a sensor and we need to find that sensor. There it is. So all we have to do now is hit that, hit apply, and we're good to go. So if we've done all, all of our physical wiring correct, then what we've just done is we've told uh, all of our hardware has hold this number right here and then this is seeing that number and it's acting upon that number uh, whether it's on or off and that's all there is to block block detection let's create a turnout now so we're going to go to line two and we're going to use it as a turnout so unlike the block detector board, which produces uh, an event, a turnout actually consumes an event. So it's going to receive information and then act upon it. So we're going to need to set it up as an output rather than an input. But first, let's name it. Uh, I named my turnout CP for control point. So we're going to just call this control point one and write it. Now, because it's a, a consumer, we need to configure the output and we're going to go with steady active high. And again, I, you know, you could go either steady active high or steady active low. The only it's, it, it would be like changing the polarity on peg one and eight of your tortoise. That's literally pretty much all you're doing uh, between steady active high and steady active low, at, at least the way I understand it. So we're going to go steady active high and we're going to disable the input. Okay. <clears throat> now, once again, when this event occurs, when this string of numbers gets sent across, uh, Event one will be, say, throwing, and event two will be throwing the other way. So down here in our sensor turnout creation, we're going to create a turnout, and I'm going to name it the same thing, say CP-1. So back here in the consumer events, we're going to go to event one, copy, paste, event two, copy, paste. So open and thrown will be OC and OD, just identical to up here, OC and OD. We've got it named, the same name as line one. So all we need to do now is make a turnout. And then we can go to our layout. 
right click on the turnout, edit, and in our drop down, we have CP1. Now, if you created, you know, lines uh, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, and they were all CPs and they hadn't been assigned yet, they would all be in this drop down. But since we only created one, there's only one option. And then you hit done, and there you go. You can see it's set for the main line. And you click and it would turn. And if you've done all your wiring correctly at the layout itself, the turnout will turn at the layout. Now for the tricky business of configuring a push button with LED control. So we're gonna to go to line three. And again, we're gonna describe this as P, B, dash one push button one okay now normally a push button would be a producer and it still is a producer but because of the the nature of how we're doing this we're not going to configure it as an input uh, if we didn't have any leds involved or we wanted to to use a whole number line just for the LEDs, uh, we would configure it as an input, but we're going to kind of cheat and use both input and output functions for the LEDs because LCC is very smart. So we're going to configure this as an output with alt sample steady active low. And if you've seen my other videos, then you understand that this is going to alternate between an input and an output state. It's going to sample the signal, I believe for 63 milliseconds. And if it detects a low, then it will light the lamp. All right, so we need to disable the input. And so our push button is now for the most part configured. Uh, so in order for this to work, we need to have the push button link back to the tortoise, the control point, the turnout. So we're going to go to the turnout and we're going to copy the, uh, uh, when this event occurs, the consumer event, we're going to copy this and we're going to go back to the push button and we're going to paste it in this section, the producer section, when this event will be sent. And right. Okay. So, so the way that's working is, is we're looking back. The push button is now going to drive the tortoise. Okay. Now we also want that to drive the LED as well. So we're also going to take this same event that we copied uh, from the turnout. We're going to copy it again and we're going to paste it here. Okay. And that's event one. We need to do the same thing with event two. So we're going to go back to the turnout and we're going to go Oops, I think I was already on event two. <clears throat> Copy. Go back to the push button. Paste. All right. And then copy again. 
placed and right. On events one and events two that we've copied and pasted from our producer section into our consumer uh, section from the push button is that these have to be turned on. Event will go event one is online active and event two line off inactive. So this is going to turn your light off and on as it is reading what's going on with the turnout because this is the this is the consumer events from the turnout reading as a producer and then these are thrown up here being read as a consumer clear as mud and then if we've done everything right then when we push the push button uh, the way the electric circuitry will work is if it's if it's at a low then our LED will turn on and we push the but push button again it will detect a high and turn off it's an off and on and I'm sure that that makes no sense to anybody uh, <laughs> It's, 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 it's a lot simpler than, than it really looks, and it's hard to understand until you've done it yourself a few times. Uh, and, and all I can say is if you've messed with any CV values on a decoder with a train, uh, it's really no different than that. It's just kind of understanding the interface of how you get what you want out of the devices that you have. But uh, I said I would do this, so I have, and uh, I'm going to move on to other things that are less tedious and technical, uh, and I will talk to you guys later.